How long will humanity persist in its waywardness? How long will injustice continue? How long is chaos and confusion to reign amongst men? How long will discord agitate the face of society? The winds of despair are at last flowing from every direction, and the strife that divides and afflicts the human race is daily increasing. The signs of impending convulsions and chaos can now be discerned, inasmuch as the prevailing order appears to be lamentably defective. Baha'u'llah. The word's equilibrium has been upset through the vibrating influence of this most great, this new world order. Mankind's ordered life has been revolutionized through the agency of this unique, this wondrous system, the like of which mortal eyes have never witnessed. Baha'u'llah. So today our speaker is Dr. Kendall Williams and his topic is how to save the world. Dr. Williams is a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and the editor of the Baha'i website, sifterofdust.org. He studied at Haverford College before attending Penn Med School and then completed his residency and chief residency at the University of Pittsburgh before returning to Penn as faculty. He's a general internist by training and the founding director of the Penn Center for Evidence-Based Practice. He's now the host of the Penn Primary Care Podcast and continues to perform clinical work and teach at Penn. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Williams. Thank you, Peimane. Well, thank you uh, everyone for, for logging on and, and joining the presentation today. Um, thank you to the Parhami family for inviting me back. Uh, my role, I think, a lot of in Baha'i Faith Modern Perspectives and the Bahami family, Armin and, um, and everyone have been dear friends of mine for many years. And I, I think one of my roles is to really um, do sort of foundational talks, I guess, if you will, to sort of cover uh, some of the basic ideas of the Baha'i teachings. Um, today, I wanted to focus uh, on the Baha'i teachings as they're applied to our world. I realized a lot of my talks, and you know, you can see some of the others on the site, um, have sort of looked backwards and given context for Baha'u'llah's faith and Baha'u'llah's teachings. But I, I really wanted to focus today on the application of what Baha'u'llah said, what Abdu'l-Baha said, is a very significant um, individual himself, Abdu'l-Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah. And, and how it applies to our world now, because it really directly applies. And for my life, uh, as I've looked throughout my life, I've been really driven throughout my life by, um, by the teachings of the Baha'i Faith and, and how they apply to the world in my life, but also uh, in what I do in the world. So this is a talk, though, about looking at our world and how do we get it better? How do we take that next step to having true peace in our world? So let's talk about the Baha'i Faith first. For those of you who are new to it, um, let's just review the basic truths of the Baha'i Faith. Uh, the Baha'i Faith is a, now a global religion. It's uh, actually the most diverse religion in the world. Uh, there are about 7 million Baha'is in the world. That means that about one out of every 1,000 people in the world is a Baha'i. Um, but we're very thinly spread out. We don't have large communities. And so there are smaller communities spread out all over the, over the world. Um, and Baha'is believe that there's one God who is the ultimate source of all reality, that the great religions of humanity have come from the same God and are all a reflection of the divine will. So we believe that all the great religions of God are fundamentally true. The difference is that Baha'is understand the great religions of humanity as having, uh, having occurred within history. And so, um, you know, they're revealed and speak to a particular people, to a particular time in history, and then history evolves, humanity grows up, and a lot of the teachings of that religion need to be sort of updated, if you will. Um, and you know, many times the religions themselves sort of go to their holy books and they try to update them as much as they can and so forth and develop more progressive ideas within their own faith. Baha'is would say, well, God does that for us. You know, so all of these great religions are effectively updating the same great religion of God that has been revealed to humanity. And by the, those religions, I mean, you know, sort of the, um, what we call the Semitic religions of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Baha'u'llah's faith follows very much within that tradition, but also recognizes that, you know, this is a process that has occurred all over the world, 
you know, even the Buddha who occurred, of course, within the ancient Hindu faith said that he was reviving an ancient path. And so, you know, they've all come into this world and really said they were reviving something from the past, but reapplying it to the modern age. Um, so we believe as Baha'is that Baha'u'llah's standards represent God's will for humanity for this time in history. Um, and the central teaching, the most fundamental thing, if you say, what's the Baha'i faith about? The Baha'i faith is about the unity of humankind, um, about the oneness of humankind. That's his basic tenet, the most fundamental principle that's said again and again in the writings of Baha'u'llah and has been emphasized further. Um, and that's one of the reasons it's the most diverse religion it is, because we have so many, we, we, we believe in the oneness of the human family. And so, you know, everybody can uh, come to under, appreciate that. So um, this is a quote of Baha'u'llah describing this process I just described um, that where all the religions of humanity are from the same God. He says, it is clear and evident that all the prophets and temples are, are the temples of the cause of God who have appeared clothed in divers attire. So they come with different clothes on, right? And a different sort of outward look. But he says, if you look with discriminating eyes, you will behold them all in the same tabernacle, soaring in the same heaven, seated upon the same throne, uttering the same speech, and very prompt and very much proclaiming the same faith. So my attraction to my faith as a Baha'i is no different from uh, uh, my Christian brothers and sisters who are attracted to the words of Jesus. It's the same reality. We're responding to the same sort of voice of God, if you will. It's such a fundamental relationship among human beings. What we're asked to do in this day is see that as all part of one process. So, you know, Baha'u'llah was uh, revealed his mission in 1863. Um, he revealed it very dramatically. Um, and really promised to be the fulfillment of the great religions of the past. He said, the revelation, which from time immemorial has been acclaimed as the purpose and promise of all the prophets of God and the most cherished desire of his messengers hath now by virtue of the pervasive will of God of the almighty and at his irresistible bidding been revealed unto men. So Baal again in his writings again and again says that his, this is not from him. He's just a human guy, just like everybody else. But what he bears and what he reveals is the revelation of God for all humanity. So the Baha'is are the only religion in the world that are not waiting for anything, right? So we're not waiting for the Messiah to return. You know, we believe that the Messiah has already returned and these are the teachings that we can build a peaceful world upon. Baha'u'llah passed away a hundred miles from Jerusalem. So this is a religion of the Holy Land, um, very much in line with everything, you know, that that we think of when we think about the great Semitic religions and the religions of the Holy Land. Okay, um, as I said, Baha'u'llah talked about this being the, the uh, religion for the oneness of humanity. He says the tabernacle of unity. So, you know, the, the tabernacle is an old idea. It, it actually goes back to the Hebrew peoples uh, who were migrant peoples. And so they would move their, 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 to follow the herds and so forth, they would travel and then they would have to set up this tabernacle, which is basically a, a church or a synagogue type of thing, but it was makeshift, if you will. Um, and that would be the place that they would worship. And so they'd have to take it all down when they moved and so forth. And so, you know, Baha'u'llah says that the, now the tabernacle of unity has been raised. And he tells all humanity, regard you not one another as strangers. You are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. And then I think in a very significant uh, passage, he says, whatsoever leads to the decline of ignorance and the increase of knowledge has been and will ever remain approved in the sight of the Lord of creation. So Baha'u'llah is talking about unity, but he's also talking about growth of intelligence, growth of knowledge, uh, decline of ignorant ideas. And that, that, was a, that is a path to lead towards unity, right? So, um, okay, um, what the, the main thing that comes out of Baha'u'llah's writings, uh, certainly having to do with the, the main teachings are this idea that we are all part of one world. Um, and he, he says to let your vision be world embracing rather than confined to your own selves. You're part of one planet. Start building the systems um, to, be at peace on that planet, okay? 
So um, what I'm going to talk about today is a lot of what uh, Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha laid out for the principles upon which we can build a united world. And, you know, Baha'u'llah described the great messengers of God, if you will, as all sort of like physicians. And I'm a physician. Um, and uh, uh, not one like Baha'u'llah, certainly. <laughs> but when you do understand processes in the human body, you can predict what's going to occur once you understand those processes. Baha'u'llah says the messengers of God have that kind of knowledge intuitively. They understand the reality of the processes in the world. And Baha'u'llah says the all-knowing physician, meaning the messenger of God, has his finger on the pulse of humanity. That's what a doctor would do to sort of, you know, diagnose something. He perceives the disease and prescribes in his unerring wisdom the remedy. And as you will see, I think that the principles that Baha'u'llah revealed and that Baha Abdu, his son Abdul Baha enunciated when he came to this country are really the principles we need to save the world, uh, to build a world of peace. And I want to demonstrate that. Baha'u'llah also recognized that the world that he lived in that the principles and ideas and social and, and political structure that existed at that time were not going to be uh, good enough to accomplish what we needed to accomplish, right? Um, Baha'u'llah's world was, you know, he revealed his religion in 1863. What was happening in 1863? Well, you know, Lincoln freed the slaves in 1863. America was a threatened sort of new idea of building a democratic country. And we know the, the Gettysburg Address where you know Lincoln talks about how we're here to pre prevent this idea from um, uh, being eradicated from the face of the earth. It was a new idea because most of the world was run by uh, kings, emperors, shahs, sultans, and so forth, right? Most of them were run by, um, uh, and actually all of them were kind in Europe, most of them were all related. Um, so, you know, this was the social structures that existed. Most of the people could not read. Uh, women had no capacity uh, and were not engaged in um, the uh, economic life uh, in a meaningful way around the world, at least um, in different parts of uh, in America and Europe, and certainly not in the Middle East. Um, you know, there really wasn't like the material that you could make a united world out of. This was a largely ignorant world. People did not uh, understand. There was very, science, science was a new thing to some degree. It was being used by European countries to dominate over others and to build their wealth. That's how science was being used in the industrial revolution. Um, the study of the 19th century is one of the most depressing things you can ever study because of what happened in the destruction of wildlife, the destruction of the planet, and so forth. This was an ugly time. And, you know, Baha'u'llah was saying that, that that world was in despair and that that order was lamentably defective, right? And so Baha'u'llah, soon after he had revealed his religion, uh, or really made known his claims locally to his own followers and some others, wrote these tablets or letters to the kings of the earth, and they were delivered by his followers to the kings. And in there, he speaks with great authority. He says, you are vassals, you are servants, because the, the messenger of God is here. But then he lays out for them a lot of the foundational principles of what a united world would be. And the most fundamental idea was justice and the absence of oppression. So he said, be vigilant, O kings, that you do not do injustice to anyone, be it to the extent of a grain of a mustard seed. Tread you the path of justice, for verily this is the straight path. Baha'u'llah said that a world needs to evolve where opp oppression and injustice is eradicated. And so that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to build. Baha'u'llah also said some very practical things, and they became very prominent, as we'll see. So he said, the time must come when the imperative necessity of the holding of a vast and all-embracing assembly, all assemblage of men will be universally realized. The rulers and kings of the earth must needs attend it. 
and participating in its deliberations must consider such ways and means as will lay the foundation of the world's great peace among men. So this is, Baha'u'llah says, all the people of the world got to get together. The kings have to be there and they have to figure out a way to stay at peace with each other. Then he said, such a peace demands that the great powers, the great powers of the world, the great kings of the world, most of which were European at that time, should resolve for the sake of tranquility of the peoples of the earth to be fully reconciled among themselves. Should any king take up arms against another, all should unitedly arise and prevent him. If this be done, the nations of the world will no longer require any armaments, except for the purpose of preserving the security of their realms and maintaining internal order within their territories. Okay, so this is a concept of, it's called international law and relations, collective security, where uh, groups enter into a pact that say, if any one of us is attacked, you're going to get the wrath of all of us, right? So the attacking nation will then be at then be enemies with all of the great, uh, all, all the, the entire collective. And so Baha'u'llah said that if you do this, be afraid to attack. Countries will be afraid to attack another because they know they'll experience the wrath of all these other countries. That's what collective security is about. So we're, we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, but I wanted to highlight a few, a couple things that I found very significant in Baha'u'llah's writings. One of them was when he wrote to the America, he wrote to the, um, the president and, and basically the senators and congressmen, uh, not how he framed it, phrased it, but that's basically what it is. And he says, it behooveth these senators and congressmen and presidents and so forth to be trustworthy among his servants and to regard themselves as the representatives of all that dwell on earth. This is what counsels you in this tablet, he who is the ruler, the all wise. Again, speaking with the voice of God. He says, if you're elected to the Senate, you're elected to the House of Representatives, you're elected president, your vision just can't be for your own place. It can't be from where you were elected from. It can't be just for your own country. You have to see yourself as representing everybody on the planet and taking into account the needs of everybody on the planet as you move forward, okay? So this is an element of wor this world embracing vision that Baha'u'llah asked us to take on. Now, very significantly, uh, Baha'u'llah passed away in prison um, as a, still effectively a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire. And his son, Abdul Baha, who's on this slide, was also a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, then the Ottoman Empire was overthrown. And I think it was 1908 or so. That freed Abdu'l Baha to travel for the first time in his life, because he had been a prison, in prison with his father since the age of 12. By this time, he was in his 60s. And so there were small fledgling Baha'i communities in the United States, and they invited him to come. And uh, they set up talks for him. And he came to the United States, and it was actually kind of a big deal. There's uh, a lot that has been written about this, but every major newspaper had stories about him and so forth. And he traveled around to the churches. He spoke at Columbia University. He spoke at Stanford. Um, he, he really laid out the truths of his father's revelation, of his father's religion. And these, are, um, these talks are compiled in a book known as Promulgation of Universal Peace. I think my face may be hiding the title on the slide, but um, you can read all of these. A few years ago, I, I, I went back, it was during the fast, I actually decided that I would read one talk a day, and I, I, read, I read them um, all, and it was really amazing to do so. And when you read those talks, you hear the principles that Baha'u'llah outlined and that his son really promulgated. So one is the absolute and fundamental equality of all the human members of the human race, the full equality of men and women, and the importance of women engaging in the full range of human endeavor. This is something that Abdu'l-Baha talked about a lot. The promotion of world citizenship and the establishment of institutions that support a unified planet. So Baha'u'llah was asked by an American senator, how could I best serve my, my country? And Abdu'l-Baha said to him, he said, you can best serve your country by applying the same principle of federalism, which is that you have these competing states, but they're on their one authority. He said, you should apply that to all the world so that though these 
countries remain independent, they have their own economies, they have their own customs and traditions, there's a certain aspect of them that is governed universally. And so um, he promoted the idea of world institutions. This is 1912, friends. Uh, so just kind of keep in mind the history here. This is before World War I, this is before World War II. Abdul Wahab promoted science, truth, and knowledge. At this point in history, people were still believing um, you know, a lot of a lot of the intelligentsia, a lot of the more sort of the academics were moving away from religion because they they um, uh, you know th they saw a conflict between science and religion, and Abdul Baha sought to dispel that. And his talks talk about that quite a bit. He said the very important aspect of the world's development was that we needed to investigate truth from ourselves. We should not blindly accept what is handed down to us by our by our by our parents, by our culture, and so forth that a lot of these reflected earlier stages of human development and that we need to be able to see the world through the new lens. He talked about the elimination of the extremes of wealth and poverty, but he was not a communist by any stretch. Uh, it was really about eliminating the extremes so that the poor had an opportunity to move forward and the rich um, would, he talked about them voluntarily giving their wealth. Uh, he didn't talk about any kind of taking of the wealth or even taxation. He talked about that humanity needs to grow up so that the rich will look at the poor and want to give money so that people will all be able to move forward together. And he talked to he, he really illustrated that these are the teachings of the, that are the true nature of religion. Um, in Abdu'l Baha, there's a wonderful uh, book called Selections from the Writings of Abdu'l Baha. And he kind of, in this first passage of that, he says, O peoples of the world, the sun of truth has arisen to illuminate the whole of earth and to spiritualize the community of man. This is mercy unalloyed and purest bounty. It is light for the world and all its peoples. It is harmony and fellowship and love and solidarity. Indeed, it is compassion and unity and the end of foreignness. It is being at one in complete dignity and freedom with all on earth. That's what Abdul Baha's vision of what we wanted to get to and what he said Baha'u'llah's teachings were all about. Okay, I wanted to highlight this a little bit because it's very significant. Here you have a religion um, that uh, was uh, specifically talking about the equality of men and women. Um, and Baha'u'llah's famous statement is, it's reiterated several times in his writings, women and men have been and will always be equal in the sight of God. Um, Abdu'l Baha then went on to say that, uh, and, Ab and Baha'u'llah insisted to his followers that the, the parents must educate their children both boys and girls. And that was significant because at that time in history, especially in the Middle East, girls were not educated. And so he said, no, all the girls should be educated. And so um, uh, even in the US at this time, it wasn't universal that, that girls were educated. Um, so uh, Baha'u'llah made that mandatory, but he also said, um, Abdul Baha also said that um, women need to be educated in the sciences and that doing so would bring about the peace of the world. He put a lot of effort on this on this issue. And I, since you're talking about half of the human race and them being educated, um, it's a big deal, right? There's no, there's no other policy, if you will, that you could implement that would have such a broad effect as something that involves half of the human race. And of course, the impact on men as well um, and, and how they would respond to the fact that women are now educated. So, you know, as I noted, um, you know, they, they gave us this world perspective. I want to talk about, so what happened, right? This is 1912, right? You've heard these principles. Uh, I just reviewed them. I won't review them again. Um, but what happened? For the most part, for the most part, they were ignored. Um, and so what did we see? Soon after Abdul Baha left the shores of the U.S., uh, you know, World War I uh, broke out, right? And so that was destructive in itself, a, a war on the European continent that was so destructive. After that, they formed the League of Nations. 
But that's, that did not succeed in quelling the fires of war on the European continent. Remember, most of the wealthiest parts of the world were Europe at that time. And so um, Ab Bahala, when he addressed his, his tablets, addressed America and Europe, as well as uh, Persia and the Ottoman Empire, because those were directly his, uh, he was, he was uh, imprisoned by those empires. Um, but, you know, these were the richest people on earth, right? And they were fighting amongst themselves. And so, you know, we had this conflagration that occurred that involved Asia um, in, in, a, in a world war in the, in the 1940s, right? Um, and, you know, you read the stories of this, it's just amazing, it's incredible. You know, the Germans invaded France and they were bombing London. And, you know, it's almost, un for people who, I was born in 1968, for me, I can't even imagine this, you know? Um, but this is what was happening on the, the European continent. And it was all, it was a conflagration, right? And it was at that point that humanity said, the prevailing order is lamentably defective. I mean, what we were doing is not gonna work in a modern world. We can't do this to ourselves anymore. And of course, World War II ended with the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so now it was a wake up call that we could literally destroy ourselves if we continue to follow along this path. And so, you know, this is the um, tableau, I guess you'd say in the, in the, in the UN um, chamber uh, of a phoenix rising from the ashes of how they needed to start an, enacting new principles if we were to survive as a world, right? And so you had the birth of the United Nations with its attendant agencies, UNICEF, uh, UNESCO, and so forth, um, all intended to create a forum for the, uh, what, what Baha'u'llah had called upon, right? That a universal forum to lay the world's great peace among humanity. This is what Baha'u'llah had called to for. It took two world wars for us to get to the point where we listened to it, but this is what he had called for. And we start to talk about how can we lay the world's great peace, right? Now, this also unlocked um, just a tremendous energy among the people of the world to really start looking at the world as part of one place, as one human family. And all these non-governmental organizations that began to arise to do good in other parts of the world, right? And we know the names of these Oxfam and Save the Children and Médecins Sans Frontières and so forth, all of these groups. But this really came about the 1950s and 60s and so forth of people really wanting to be part of a world and start to care about the, the uh, people beyond their borders, right? Possibly the most significant um, event that happened in this period was the formation of the, Na the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. And so um, NATO consisted of most of the countries that Baha'u'llah had addressed tablets to. Um, only Iran and Russia as entities are not part of NATO, but NATO is founded on the idea that Baha'u'llah revealed in his tablets, right? of collective security. And we hear this, it's on the news every day, right? Ukraine has been attacked by Russia. What is NATO gonna do? Is Ukraine becoming a NATO country? This is all about whether or not Ukraine is now gonna be considered part of the fold of countries that they, that they need to now protect, right? Because if you go to war with one, you go to war with all. So has this idea worked? Oh, it's worked profoundly, uh, it's been a profoundly effective. Um, you know, the, most of the wealthier countries of the world have been at peace with each other for now, ever since NATO was formed, 80 years or whatever it is. And so um, this principle of collective security that Baha'u'llah enunciated has been profoundly effective, right? Now, nothing's perfect, and we all know there's back and forth about things, but I think it's important that we sort of step back and say, what's been achieved here? This was the application of a principle that Baha'u'llah revealed, and it's been extremely effective. And we've tried to expand it, right? Africa has its own sort of organization. There's been other organizations, and everybody's trying to sort of develop their, um, their collective security, if you will. So 
What also happened at this time was that humanity sort of established and said, listen, these are the things that every human right, every person on the planet has a right to. These had never been spoken before. I mean, we have documents like this going back to the Magna Carta and then uh, the Declaration of Independence and so forth. But now we have what we call the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? where we had a shared principles about the way human beings should be treated all over the planet, okay? And then we had much more maturation in this idea of international law. And we had the formation of the Genocide Convention, which is in the news now because of what's happening in Israel, right? And all the nations, you know, NATO nations all signed on to this. Um, so it established a framework for us all to agree that certain things should happen and certain things should never happen, right? In our, in our new civilized world. Okay, what happened with the education of women? Well, you know, uh, Baha'u'llah and Abdu Baha's promotion of this did not, um, uh, it's not the sole idea that led to the education of women, but it was obviously a fantastic idea because if you study the social and economic development of any one country, one of the most potent things, if not the single most potent thing that can be done to improve the social and economic status of a country is to educate women. And we ha now have statistics on this. This is well established. We studied it in my master's in public health degree. If you wanna, if you wanna improve the social and economic health status of your country, educate your women. Um, it, it, and it's also the quickest way to get a society from being illiterate to being literate. You end up with a lower population growth if you do that. Um, which becomes very critical in dealing with the environmental crisis that we're facing. Um, you know, China enacted a one-child policy to try and restrict the population. In reality, the more effective means is simply educate women, because once women are educated, then they get engaged in uh, the, the, uh, the world, so family sizes become smaller and so forth. But more importantly, it really empowered a different voice in world affairs, a voice that we're all hearing now uh, in the world. So these, my point with these slides is to show you that the ideas that Abdu'l Baha and Baha'u'llah promoted, now we have some perspective on them. These were started in the late 19th century. Abdu'l Baha was here in 1912. Now we have, you know, over 112, I guess 112 years where we can look back at these principles and see what have they accomplished. These principles have been the best ideas uh, for the world um, because they've led. And so my argument here is to say, you know, maybe Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha knew something, right? Maybe they did have their finger on the pulse of humanity. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, where are we now, right? Oh, I put this slide in. I wanted to show you um, that, you know, Baha'u'llah talked about that new and wondrous sciences would come into the world, right? And, you know, if you look at this graph, this is something that I pull off the internet. It's not, you know, drawn to scale necessarily, but, um, you know, about 18, mid 1800s, you get this remarkable increase in technology, right? So let's look at the state of the world now. Where are we in relation to all this in 2024? So I think the one thing I wanted to point out is a, is a fundamental idea that you'll hear Baha'is talk about in different ways. Um, but, um, when you know Baha'u'llah came, he was fulfilling religious prophecies, right? And so, and he was of course aware of that and, and spoke to that. And he, you know, there's always this idea that there would become a day of judgment in the future, uh, or there'd be a day of resurrection in the future. And what Baha'u'llah said is that it's not physical. It's a day of judgment on old ideas. Um, and it's a day of resurrection for new ideas. And the analogy that was given in the Baha'i writings to reflect this process was the springtime. If you think about the spring, um, what happens? Well, certainly you get the birth of new flowers and trees and the blossoms come out and so forth. So you have a, this day of revival and resurrection, but there's also the death of something old, right? The seasons have gone through their processes. The winter reflected the death of the old, the previous year. And now you see the day of resurrection. So um, the Baha'i writings also talk about 
two processes in the world, the process of integration, where the world is coming together, and a process of disintegration, where a lot of the structures, a lot of the social structures, a lot of religious structures, a lot of the political ideas that held together peoples for generations are now no longer fitting our, the world in which we live, right? There's been a judgment upon them, right? And they're falling down and there's a resurrection of new ideas. So this, I, and I think this is a very important way of thinking about the world because whenever something new comes in, whenever something new is happening, there has to be the death of something old, right? It's just the nature of the world we live in, not only in the natural world and the physical world, but also in the realm of ideas. Now, Baha'u'llah said something quite lovely. He said, as bad as it has been, he said that order was defective, but he also said the whole earth was in a state of pregnancy, right? And this was him in the 19th century, right? He said, the day is approaching when it have yielded its noblest fruits, when well, from it will have sprung forth the loftiest trees, the most enchanting blossoms, the most heavenly blessings. So we're seeing that and we live that right now. The internet's part of that. Us able to talk on a Zoom call and do this is part of that, right? We're part of a new and refreshing time in history unlike the world has ever seen. So let's sort of look at the state of the world. On the good column, we can say very good things. There's a rising levels of education and development. We've had more uh, economic development and education in the last 20 years than at any time in history. There's been a reduction of violent conflict overall. You wouldn't believe that from looking at the, what we see in the world every day. Uh, there are two major conflicts in the world. Uh, and some others, but nevertheless, there's actually been a, a decline in the number of people killed in the violent conflicts up until at least a couple of years ago, right? The health of the peoples of the world is dramatically improved from what it was before. There's been an improvement in the status of women. We now have a worldwide communication system, right? The internet. Uh, I routinely communicate with people I've never met from other parts of the world. Um, and uh, so, that's remarkable. Uh, there's been an increase in human mobility where, you know, my daughter right now is travel is, is studying abroad. Um, she's in Europe. Her, her and her friends decided to go to Dublin for the weekend um, and to experience life in Dublin and then they'll fly back, right? And, you know, that's just Europe, but that's, you know, she was just here last week. So this is an increase in human mobility, but that also means that humans can move around, right? So we get whole issues that come up about immigration. We get this whole new range of issues. My point actually that I'll just highlight here is that the standards that we used to deal with these problems a hundred years ago, they're not the standards that we need, okay? They don't work anymore. This is a new world. This is a resurrected world, if you will, right? So on the negative, what do we have? Well, ethnocentric ideologies remain prominent, okay? So very strong, you know, listen, the ethnocentric uh, war, the, the war between Russia and Ukraine is, is all about, you know, the Russian government saying, this part belongs to us and needs to be turned back to Russia. People need to learn Russian and so forth, right? It's, it's just ethnocentric in its, in, in its uh, purest form, right? Um, the war in Israel is very much uh, a, an issue of ethnocentrism, right? Only our people can live here. Right. Um, so we're seeing these forces and we've seen them throughout history. Right. With, you know what Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King fought against was ethnocentrism. It's the universal idea that only our people deserve this or that. OK, just because we share some genetic heritage. Right. Um, so that's a negative thing that's happening in the world and it's causing a lot of damage. It's a terrible idea. And it needs to be abandoned because it's killing us, literally. I look at 13,000 children killed in Gaza. This is ethnocentrism. These are, this is what this is about. This is the fight over a piece of dirt, a span of earth, and who can live there, right? And people lose their lives and people lose their families because of these ideas. Ideas are what kill people, not bombs. So that's one of the ones that I'm particularly fired up about recently. But, you know, there's also this idea of competition that constantly exists, right? We have rising politi political partisanship. The U.S. is just racked with this, right? 
there is a natural tension between liberal and conservative forces. Now, to some degree, this is normal, right? Whenever something new happens, you have the early adopters and you have the late adopters. You know, when the iPhone came out, I wasn't an early adopter. But, you know, and so you have these folks that want to stick with what they know. And then you have the folks that are sort of open and want to do progressive. Both of them are right because in many ways, conservative uh, ideas of, you know, there are certain eternal human values. You know, these are conservative ideas, right? That, that there's moral principles and we need to have these. I mean, those are, those are true. But on the other hand, you have to deal with the world, the modern world. And so there's a natural tension that exists there. It's a normal thing. Uh, we often sort of make it into more of what it is in the political realm. The reality is it's a normal thing, right? If there's a normal tension. But now we're sort of, we, it's been made into a big political thing that's very, especially in the U.S., very challenging. We have debates about immigration, which are only going to increase because of rising world temperatures. There's going to be parts of the planet that are not habitable, where a lot of people live. And we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Um, what, disappointingly, more recently, there's been a loss of faith in international institutions, those institutions that were built after World War II and have maintained the peace, of the, the peace that has existed to a great degree. So we have a lot of challenges. I'm going to argue to you that the problem is not structural or political. The problem is cultural. And, um, and it has to do with the fact that we have not yet fully embraced the true principles and ethics and virtues and values that we need to live in the world that exists. So this quote from Abdu'l-Baha, he says, a new age is here and creation is reborn. Humanity has taken on new life. The autumn has gone by and the reviving spring is here. All things are made new. Arts and industries have been reborn. There are new discoveries in science. Renewal is the order of the day. The people, therefore, must be set completely free from their old patterns of thought. They must be completely free from their old patterns of thought. That all their attention may be focused on these new principles, for these are the light of this time and the very spirit of the age. So it's not, we don't have a political problem necessarily. Politics is the froth on the ocean. I want to, I want to give this analogy for you. Most of the time, especially in the popular media and so forth, the focus will be on the political clashes that exist. And I'm going to argue that those are almost meaningless. I mean, these are the folks that ultimately make the decisions for us as a species. So we have to pay attention to it. But unfortunately, oftentimes, it's very superficial, right? And the sort of the metaphor that came to my mind was the froth on the ocean, right? When waves, cultural waves come together, you get a clash and you get this froth, right? And that froth is what we see in the media. But what's really going on and what's really important is the ocean waves themselves, right? That's culture, right? So if we focus too much on the froth on the ocean, that's not important. That's just two waves coming together. That's not important at all. If you want to Keep the ocean from having froth, forget it. What you have to focus on if you want to improve the froth and get rid of the froth and the clash is you got to still the ocean, right? And so the way you still the ocean is you deal with culture, all of those forces that are beneath it. So this is what Baha'is do. We're not political at all. Um, and so, you know, we're told to avoid partisan politics like the plague. Um, because what we've been asked to do is to really promote these ideas that are cultural ideas that we can then build and save a new world, right? We need to sort of um, uh, invigorate the body of humanity with new ideas and new life. So let me just go over some of the fundamental ideas that you can put into your life every day that you can teach your children. Uh, if you want to join in with Baha'i activities to do this, great. If not, that's fine too. But these are the ideas that we need to build a new culture around worldwide, okay? First is we have to embrace the oneness of humanity, okay? And we have to embrace that this isn't just a thing you say. A lot of politicians and people say, oh, well, yes, yeah, humanity's one, that's right, yeah. No, when you think about it deeply, it means that there's some fundamental things that must change if we're going to truly embrace the oneness of humanity. There's a 
the grandson uh, of Abdul Baha, uh, the great grandson of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi, led the Baha'i community for 36 years. And he has this very powerful quote, which I've always loved. He says, the principle of the oneness of you mankind, the pivot around all the Baha'u'llah's teachings, is no mere outburst, outburst of ignorant emotionalism or an expression of vague and pious hope. He says it implies an organic change in the structure of present day society, a change such as the world did not yet experience. He said, this isn't just an idea that's kind of nice and it's vague and it's pious and it sounds kind of nice and we write songs about it. That's not what I'm talking about. He said, if you wanna, if, when you really digest the idea of the oneness of humanity, it has to cause structural changes in the way we do things. Now the UN is certainly an example of a structural change, but when you think about it deeply, you recognize that you can't pick sides anymore, okay? When two people are at war, you know, I mean, it's, it's when two nations are at war, we, we, we can't raise our kids to pick sides so much, right? Uh, unless it's based on a certain moral principle, right? We can't become ethnocentric in our approaches to life, okay? Abdu'l Baha says, cleanse your eyes that you may behold no man is different from yourselves. See you no strangers, see all men as friends. For love and unity comes hard when you fix your gaze on otherness, right? Need to look at the children in Gaza, the families in Gaza, and the Israelis who are fearful of their own safety as being part of our family. They're all just human beings and they're responding to forces that um, any human being might respond in the same way and placed in the same situation. And when we understand that all humanity is one and all humans do what they do for similar reasons, then we can start to apply principles to get rid of those problems. Uh, but if we just say it's them, they're the problem, then, and sometimes they are the problem, but, but you know, you have to at least understand where people are coming from. And so if we see, if we strip away the inherent biases that we have and cleanse our eyes, that we don't see people as different from ourselves, then we can start understanding what the oneness of humanity is about. So I love this passage because it's really an interesting passage. Baha'u'llah said in one of his tablets, he said, of old it's been revealed that love of one's country is an element of the faith of God, right? And we know this, right? We see. Americans are patriots and, you know, we have July 4th and it's a religious holiday as much as, you know, a patriotic holiday. Patriotism and love of faith have been, have been combined. Baha'u'llah's challenging us. He says, in this day, it is not who boasts who loves his country, but it is his who loves the world. Boast if you love the world, not if you love your country. But then he says something very powerful. He says, through the power released by these words, God has lent a fresh impulse and set a new direction to the birds of men's hearts. And every trace of restriction and limitation has been obliterated from um, the God's holy book. So if we view each of the great religions as part of one faith, right? Any trace of restriction and I'm better than you and we're the chosen people and any of that, that's been obliterated. It doesn't exist in the holy book anymore, in the real, in the real faith of God, right? Um, so that's what he's telling us. The new, this is a new standard for today. Just as when Jesus came into the world and said, you know, you've heard it old, old you should not um, murder your brother. I said, don't get angry with the brother, right? That was a new standard. Baha'u'llah's coming into the world. He said, this is a new standard. Love of all humanity. Okay, you have to avoid oppression of all forms. You have to teach your children to avoid oppression of all forms. It's work. Um, it's work to teach your children to oppress. And we have this natural desire uh, to dominate others if we're fearful. And uh, Baha'u'llah says, incline your hearts to the counsels given by the most exalted pen and beware lest your hands or tongues cause harm to anyone among mankind, right? It's not hard to not do harm to any other people, to treat them all with love and respect all the time, no matter what their situation, no matter what their struggles they're dealing with, no matter what, treat them with respect all over, even if they've done terrible things. We're trying to teach people a new way. This one struck me very much because of what's happening in Israel right now. Um, 
where we focus on these holy places and think that they're the important thing. And, you know, the Baha'i writings say, guard yourselves that you may not be in any way the cause of sadness to any soul, inasmuch as the hearts of the faithful are dearer to God than a house made of clay. These places in the world, this dust, this heap of land, these places we build, they're just dust, they're just dirt. They're just dirt brought together. You know, they're not holy in themselves. They're only holy because of the attachment that they give them. And human beings are more holy than those pieces of dirt, okay? We have to teach our children to be just and fair-minded. Um, and everybody talks about justice, and I'm not sure we really fully embrace it. Baha'u'llah says, the light of men is justice. Quench it not with the contrary winds of oppression and tyranny, right? So we're building a new culture in the world. That's what I said. We, that's what we're trying to do now, right? We want to, um, oppression and tyranny are our enemies. And then Baha'u'llah says, the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity. You can't have unity if it's not fair. This happens in my own home with my own children, right? I want them to be united. They say, no, he stole that from me, you know? So you gotta work out the justice piece before you can get to the unity piece. Or you say, okay, and you negotiate with them, but that happens on a world level. People have to be treated fairly. Otherwise, it's an oppressor-oppressed relationship, right? If you're going to be treated as equals, everybody has to have, a, have an opportunity. To, uh, there has to be justice, right? So Baha'u'llah says, and you know, he has a way of just telling us how significant these words are. He says, the ocean of divine wisdom surges in that word. Um, while the books of the world cannot contain its inner significance. Just that concept of justice and unity and their connection together. But Baha'u'llah well, speaks to something else. If you read his writings, there's a lot about fair-mindedness. Blessed are the fair-minded. Blessed are those who look at all things with their searching eye, right? And he talks to his own followers. He says, it behooves the loved ones of God to be forbearing towards their fellow men. And to be so sanctified, sanctified and detached from all things. Not petty, right? Not petty, not into the, the little petty arguments that people get into, right? Detached from that. To evince such sincerity and fairness that all the peoples of the earth begin to recognize them as the trustees of God. So what he's saying is the concept of God, that what religion's really about, people should look to you and say you embody it right? Because you're sincere and you're fair. Blessed are they who on the wings of certitude have flown in the heavens which the pen of thy Lord, the all-merciful, hath spread. The element, uh, the connection that Baha'u'llah makes between the spiritual growth of an individual, detaching themselves from the emotions of the day, right? And who are fair, who are sincere, right? That's a spiritual growth. You have, to, you have to work on that. I mean, I look at times in my life when I've done things that I'm now ashamed of or said things I'm now ashamed of or got angry when I, and I'm now ashamed because I was attached to some emotion or some slight or something. And as I've gone older and been working on my sense of detachment, I feel I've become more fair. You know, it frees me up to be more sincere. And that's a that's a process of spiritual growth, but the Baha'u'llah makes that connection. And, you know, he's really telling us, I think, that you can't have a world of peace unless you change the people, right? They can't be petty. They have to be fair-minded. And the people in my world that I respect the most are the fair-minded ones. Those that are constantly making fights and trying to build up contention and conflict, I don't respect those people. I respect the people that are wise and fair-minded and see the rights of everyone. That's what we need to develop. Be trustworthy. Baha'u'llah tells us that trustworthiness is the, is, is the greatest portal leading to the tranquility and security of people. In truth, the stability of every affair depends on it. All the domains of power, of grandeur, and of wealth are illumined by its light. What does he mean by that? Our financial systems depend on trustworthiness. There's nothing else that holds them up. It's the countries that, that support the Federal Reserve dollar or whatever. It's based on the trustworthiness of those who stand behind those, those monies, 
right? And so we have a breakdown of trustworthiness in our society on the governmental level, on the media level, um, and so forth, right? So we have to start to become and teach our children that tr they have to be trustworthy. This comes from teaching my child when she lies about the fact that this, the trustworthiness is the, I mean, my wife and I say this a hundred times a month, okay? And it's because we're trying to build up these qualities of trustworthiness, extremely important. Our world is held together by trustworthiness, by, by uh, me being able to trust you in our interactions. We have to build unity with intention, okay? So um, unity just doesn't come about. You have to work at it. Um, there's this passage of Baha'u'llah. He says, that, oh, my friend, in all circumstances, one should seize upon every means which will promote security and tranquility among the peoples of the world. That may be just hosting a diverse group of your neighbors who are from different backgrounds in your home once a month for a potluck dinner, right? This is people coming together from different tribal groups and being together and sharing a meal and sharing music, right? This is all circumstances, all the activities that we do, a football game, you know, where everybody gets a, the, together. We should promote ideas of oneness and, and, and peace and stability, right? In every opportunity we should have, we shall promote unity to promote the security and tranquility. He says, whatever purges you from corruption and leads you towards peace and composure is the straight path. You have to do this intentionally though. I wanted to make this point. This is a beautiful idea. And it's, a, it's in the writings of Abdu'l Baha. Abdu'l Baha gives an example of nature. And he says, look at the simplest thing in nature. He said, and I use this, I have this beautiful picture of a flower with a bee and I'm gonna use it. He says, think about that flower. And certainly that bee, right? bees are part of a, a hive, right? This is an extraordinarily ordered structured situation. And Abdul Baha makes the point, he says, unity, cooperation, collaboration is life. That's what life is. Life requires those things. Dissolution, conflict, contention is what leads to death, right? So it's unity and collaboration in these things. Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha are talking about this because this is what leads for life, society to have life. All, I, mean, I thankfully have not experienced a major war in my society, many people have had, and all they see around them is death because of conflict, right? Unity is something we have to intentionally build. Baha'u'llah says that conflict and contention are categorically forbidden. He says, this is a decree of God very powerful. He said it's divinely preserved from annulment. You can't change it. He says conflict and contention is now forbidden by God. So very powerful statements from, 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 from God, right? So uh, I always found this to be very direct and very clear. And I always like that. Conflict and contention are categorically forbidden in his book. This is a decree of God. Very powerful, very beautiful. So I'm just going to say a couple more things and I just wanted to highlight because I these are the things I'm thinking about in rebuilding a new culture. There's many others and others would come up with other things, but this is what I came up with. Allow yourselves to love humanity. Um, don't hide in the protection. Don't fear. There's nothing valuable that comes from fear. Allow yourselves to love. Baha'u'llah says the purpose of religion is love. The beginning of religion is love for God, and its end is to manifest that love to his servants. I love this. This was recently translated, a passage of Baha'u'llah. He says, in every dispensation, every religion, every messenger of God that's come to humanity, he says, all the divine laws and ordinances are changed and altered according to the requirements of the time, except the law of love, which like a stream flows continuously and whose course never suffers alteration or change. Right? So the constant between in, in, in the religions of humanity that uh, have sort of elevated the consciousness of humanity is love. A um, couple other things I wanted to point out. Embrace reality and truth. Don't be afraid of it. The world, the world is a beautiful thing and it's been brought into being um, 
and we have a special place in it. We shouldn't be afraid of anything in the world. We shouldn't be afraid of truth. So, you know, we, we get scared and so we hide into our own. I did this younger person, you know, I wanted to defend my little idea. And I realized that if I embrace reality, um, that my ideas expanded and my faith actually increased the more I understood science. So it's not just embrace it. Um, there's a beautiful passage. This is a little bit different maybe, but I, I, I had this slide and, and I wanted to put it in because it says so much. It's one of my favorite passages in all the writings of Baha'u'llah. And it's God speaking directly to the human heart. And he says, out of the waste of nothingness with the clay of my command, I made you to appear as a human being. And I've ordained for thy training every atom in existence and the essence of all created things. God is saying, you know, think about evolution. Out of the waste of nothingness, human beings have appeared. And he says, you know, now you have this consciousness. You have a rational mind. You have a spiritual soul. And I've ordained this world for you to be trained by it, to understand it. And he says, I, I, I prepared the way for you. He says, thus before, ere thou didst issue from thy mother's womb, I destined for thee two fonts of gleaming milk, eyes to watch over thee, our families, and hearts to love thee. And he says, this was purposeful. And my purpose in all this was that thou mightest attain my everlasting dominion and become worthy of mine invisible bestowals. So our lives have purpose. We shouldn't hide ourselves from the world. Uh, we've been brought here for a reason, um, and that's a spiritual reason. As part of that process, we need to not be afraid. You need to embrace pain and challenges. Abdu'l Baha said, the mind and spirit of man advance when he is tried by suffering. The more the ground is plowed, the better seed will grow, the better the harvest will be. Just as the plow furrows the earth deeply, purifying it of weeds and thistles. So suffering and tribulation free us from the petty affairs of this worldly life until we arrive at a state of complete detachment. When I was a young man and I hadn't yet experienced much in life, I would read passages from the writings of Baha'u'llah where he talked about suffering, his own suffering and how he responded to it and so forth. And I'd feel kind of down and I'd be like, you know, why is he so down all the time? And then as I went through life and I began to experience difficulties, and challenges, not anywhere near what many of our brothers and sisters around the world experience. Um, but uh, I began to understand what this was all about, that Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha and his passages talking about this are talking about how you effectively deal with suffering and difficulty and loss, because the, the inappropriate ways to, to, to deal with that lead to violence and aggression. And it's people that have been victimized rising up against their oppressors. Um, you know, how do we deal effectively with um, ourselves being victimized? How do we raise that to another level? And then we look to people like Gandhi or Dr. Martin Luther King or others who have found ways to express their victimization in a way that was noble and didn't make them become worse than their oppressors, right? And so we have to deal with suffering and loss in a way that is noble. And much of the Baha'i writings is about this, it seems to me, uh, how we can do that. So I wanted to just come back to these ideas that were on the earlier slide, where Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l Baha talked, what he talked about when he came to the US, and just you know highlight them again, that. It's not just these spiritual qualities I've been highlighting on the earlier slide, but these other sort of, um, how, uh, no, it's, I don't want to say social, but how we express these in our in the world. And you know, it's really been part of my life to uh, promote these, and uh, and uh, I, it, I think it gives you a new perspective on what we can be as a planet and where we're headed. Um, I had a several different options for how I wanted to end this talk, but um, I had this slide and I, it struck me very much because, you know, Baha'u'llah says, after he gives his revelation, it's so wonderful, Baha'u'llah's re religion. He speaks with the voice of God, and then he speaks as just a human being, you know? And he says, 
Oh, how I long to announce unto every spot on the surface of the earth and carry to each one of its cities the glad tidings of this revelation. Because he knew that these principles and ideas would eventually bring the world up to full maturity. Um, and we have that opportunity. And that's why, you know, uh, we all, that's why we have these presentations is so that we can spread it. Um, and it's not about people becoming Baha'is. It's about spreading ideas. Ideas are what changes the world. What Baha'u'llah brought us are ideas and principles and inspiration and paths and practices that we can use to change the world and make it a better place. Um, I know changing the culture of our world, it's very tempting to look in a four-year window and say, if my guy gets an office, boy, it's all gonna be great, right? That's not realistic. I know that the cultural change that the world, that is gonna happen in the world is going to be generations beyond what I am able to contribute. Um, and that all I can do is do my part in my local environment to promote these ideas and make the world a better place for our future generations. Um, it's a slow process, but it can also happen quickly. Uh, you see it every day as people, new generations come up and say, we don't want to live in that world anymore. We don't want these prejudices. We want fairness and justice for everyone. Um, but that's a, that's, I think cultural change is a slow process, but we need to embrace it. Thank you all for listening to my long-winded talk today. I hope you enjoyed it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that was a really great talk. Uh, we have some time for questions, so people can put their questions in the chat. I'm looking at one of the comments, and I, I, I wanted to comment on... Um, uh, an individual expressed uh, their experiences of Baha'is and feeling judged and even condemned based on things that in the past. And, you know, we all have inherited um, ways of doing things um, from our society. Um, being judgmental and condemning others is not part of the Baha'i faith. Um, it's very clear and the hidden words in particular you know, uh, very strong on this, um, on how uh, we need to treat each other. Um, Baha'u'llah said he was bringing into a world of, of uh, a religion of tolerance and benevolence. And um, it's, it's a process that we all go through. And, and um, we are such a judgmental society. <laughs> Uh, we are a profoundly judgmental society. Um, you know, social media has sort of, you know, people can hide behind names and things on social media and you don't know who they are. It's like drunk, it's like, you know, it's like cars that are driving, people are in their cars and they behave in ways they would never behave in front of actual other human beings. And social media has the same influence. And then you just see how judgmental people are. It's very hard not to fall into the same trap. We're inherently judgmental in our humanity. Um, but we don't have to be. And um, there's what the wonderful stories in the Baha'i faith about not being judgmental and how that, um, but we're not gonna, the, the worst thing you can do for the spiritual development of yourself and for others is to be judgmental of other people. Um, nobody's gonna listen to you or even respect you or seek to use you as an example if, you, if they feel judged. And uh, so, it's just really a fundamental aspect of spiritual life. Um, it's a little deeper element. Uh, I think a lot of communities when they're on the surface and they have a superficial standard of certain moral behaviors, um, but uh, that they, they become judgmental communities. I, I really don't ha hope that ha doesn't happen to our community or that we keep you know, working to avoid it uh, coming into our community. Can you comment on integrating of protected characteristics, people like disabled, neurodivergent, gender fluid into the faith, please? The principle of unity and diversity is not equally applied globally. Yeah, so um, there are characteristics of human beings that um, uh, Adda Baha talks about this. He says that are fundamental and eternal. And then there are those that he calls accidental. And 
accidental in the old philosophical sense from you know Aristotle and Plato and so forth was something that that was not fundamental. It just happened because it was random, right? And so um, I think that uh, a lot of these characteristics that we then divide ourselves into, you know, we're, we're this, um, you know, we're, we're trying to identify, find our own identities within those realities. Um, they're accidental. And what, what uh, Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha are asking us to do is to see people as human souls and see them as the expression of the attributes of God. Um, those attributes are all throughout the writings. And so um, the, and each, each, each has great deal of capacity, right? And um, I think in America today, we're very focused on the accidental aspects of our humanity. Um, and to our detriment to some degree, um, that doesn't mean those accidental aspects are, those superficial aspects are not important uh, or not uh, things that people have to manage and deal with. Um, uh, but they're not the fundamental part. And so, you know, um, the whole discussion of religion in this country is mostly on these superficial aspects. Uh, and when you study the Baha'i writings in particular, something like the hidden words or um, it's, it's just not there, you know? And, and it, because the, what, what God cares about is our souls, right? Uh, are we, are we, uh, well, I, I could go on, but I have, I have, I have many friends and, and patients who I love dearly who live lives that are different than, than I have chosen to live. Um, but I see within them just this beauty as people. And, uh, you know, uh, so I don't know. Some of my favorite people are recovered drug addicts um, who I, uh, I had the opportunity to meet and even active drug addicts who are struggling with it. Um, just, uh, it just, it, it brings you down to your humanity. And I just want to deal with people on the human level, not on the level of whatever other thing, you know, that we talk about. Um, great summary of the last 150 years of human history. One comment and one question. You speak of cultural challenge, but I would rather say spiritual challenge. Question, yeah. Shoghi Effendi speaks of changing the structure of present day society. This is an overwhelming challenge. How individually can we contribute to solving this overwhelming challenge? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and I agree. Uh, when we talk about cultural or spiritual, I think I, I'm using the, the, the word cultural in a sense of not political, right? Um, and, um, but, it, but ultimately, when we talk about, you know, I'm interested in defining these words. You know, what do you mean by, what do we mean by, moral development? What do we mean by spiritual development? What do we mean by these things? And for Baha'is, we use them somewhat interchangeably, but they, um, but I don't know if they apply in it, they are heard interchangeably. Um, so let me just speak that a little bit. Um, when we talk, when I'm talking about a cultural change, I'm not talking about getting somebody elected into office or political. Those are, those are simply the sort of the froth in the ocean, right? So what, what we need to change is the cultural aspects, which actually has to do with education, both spiritual and moral education, uh, but also just education generally, knowing more about the world, uh, science and, and uh, humanities and so forth. Um, for Baha'is, we talk about spiritual challenges and, um, and they, for us, they're the same thing because we see, like in that passage that Baha'u'llah, where he says, you know, Baha'i should be detached and fair minded, right? A lot of folks, do, and I didn't for many years, make the connection between that and unity. Um, but you can't have unity unless people, you can't have true unity unless people have arisen above their pettiness, right? And so, because natural pettiness is going to put people in conflict. And so, what Baha'is are saying, which I think is unique in the world, is that the cultural change we need to support institutions, political and social institutions, that, that it needs to be, we can't be petty. 
but that's a spiritual process, right? Of detaching yourself from your own petty concerns and seeing the broader picture. And that's, a, that's an issue of spiritual development. Um, so I just wanted to kind of, I think that's a really good point about, um, I don't know that our world is going to have dramatic changes in the structural aspects um, within my lifetime. And I'm 55 years old. Um, I think the countries that are dominant are probably still going to be dominant, but we're seeing changes um, uh, in more and more of the world is being educated, more and more of the world is stepping forward, more and more of the world that people who were previously oppressed are standing forward and very eloquently enunciating a lot of these Baha'i principles. And I see that changes, but I don't know if there'd be the structural changes within my lifetime. Which is why I think that for me, um, I want to focus on the cultural stuff. I want to focus on building the, the infrastructure that can support the social and, and governmental changes that will eventually occur, um, that will provide a structure for peace on our planet. I got some snow behind me. I'm in Northeast Pennsylvania, and we're going to climb that mountain, and we're going to slide down. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> and wow. I wish you all fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got my kids. They're waiting for me to come talk, so we could go do that. It's going to be cold and a lot of fun. One day you'll all be here. I hope and we could do it together. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your talk and for giving us your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, thank you. So our speaker next week will be um, Mr. Masood Olufani. And his topic will be the blues idiom of Abdu'l-Bahá, um, looking at the color blue as a spiritual metaphor for the character of Abdu'l-Bahá. So these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. And I put the link to our YouTube channel and mailing list in the chat. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next week. Bye.